I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so how many of you people like crime stories or like to, to watch TV? And yeah, right. You can raise your hand. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, Leah and I used to love to watch Forensic Files. I don't know if you've ever seen that because I really like the science part of how they figure out what happened in a crime. I mean, like there was this one time they, 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 they caught this guy because he tried to burn evidence of the crime. And how they found him was they they analyzed the smoke residue that was in the tree bark above where he had burned the stuff. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> and then another one where they exonerated this guy because they found insect larva on a discarded um, weapon. And they said, well, the insect larva, it's only happening at this time. And that was way before the crime. And so it was really interesting. Anyway, I had ended up stop watching those because they got to the point where they had a lot of real brutal cr sort of crimes and you had to wade through a lot of that to get to the science part. But anyway, that kind of show is really popular, whether true crime podcasts or on TV or even the fictional ones. They're really popular. And um, so looking at what happened in crimes and how they unfolded and talking to eyewitnesses is all kind of really interesting to people. But perhaps there is probably no crime that has ever been stu more studied and analyzed and written about and talked about than the and so well known as the one recorded in Mark chapter 15, and that's, of course, the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, if you've been with us so far or been with us recently, uh, if you've read the Gospel of Mark, along with the other Gospel writers, we've gotten a really good comprehensive picture of what has been going on in Jesus' trials, his scourging. We know about his torture and the long road to Calvary. We've heard about that. Um, we know about the crown of thorns, the nails, the darkness, the earthquake, all of those things. We know that he was deserted by his friends. He was mocked by his enemies, that the soldiers uh, gambled for his clothing, and though he was in three grueling hours of agony as he hung on the cross, instead of condemnation for those who plotted his murder, uh, he offered grace and another chance at redemption, uh, as he quoted from Psalm 22, and we talked about that last time, and we ended kind of part one of this uh, this part of the lesson in Mark 15 with a look at how that specific psalm was really basically the soundtrack for the whole crucifixion scene. And I hope you've had time to think about that and roll that around in your head and look at that some more in, in your own time. But today we're going to finish up Mark 15 with Christ's death and burial. Now, uh, instead of just going through the passage in order, verse by verse, like we normally do, what I want to do is kind of like what they would do in a crime scene investigation. And that is they start at the end where the body is laid and work backward from that to see what happened. And so that's kind of what we're going to do. We're going to start at the end of these 10, 10 verses here in the last chapter, uh, last section of Mark 15 with Christ's burial where he lands and then back up from that step by step just to get some eyewitness accounts of what happened and then back and end up in verse 37 with his death. So we're going to jump right in. It started at the end, like I said, and this is the end here, verse 42 to 47. And so by the, and de, uh, so besides the di disciples that we know, the 12 disciples, two of Jesus' other devoted followers were the Pharisees, uh, were two Pharisees. And Mark tells us that one is named Joseph. That's what we see there in verse 42, is Joseph of Arimathea. And he is the first eyewitness we're going to talk to today and learn from today. Besides him, there was another Pharisee that Mark doesn't mention, but John tells us about him, and he was Nicodemus. And we know about Nicodemus from John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world, that verse. Well, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus when that was said. And so Nicodemus shows up at the beginning of John, and he also comes back around at the end of John, John 19, where John tells us that he was one of the followers at the crucifixion and burial scene. But since we're studying Mark, we'll just talk about Joseph here. And so here's what we know about our eyewitness, Joseph of Arimathea, and that is that Mark tells us that he's been waiting for the kingdom of God, and he's a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, he's also was opposed to the Sanhedrin's decision against Jesus, is what Luke tells us. Luke also tells us that he's a secret follower of Christ and feared the council, and so he didn't ever 
well, he didn't speak up. Matthew tells us he was wealthy. Luke also tells us he was good and upright. And Matthew tells us that he was a disciple. So this is our eyewitness. And he kind of stayed in the background uh, during the entire three years of Jesus' ministry. But somewhere along the way, he saw enough, heard enough, and then he believed and followed Jesus in the background. And so here after the crucifixion, though, he can't worry about uh, being secret anymore or staying in the background or what will happen to him with the, if the Sanhedrin finds out about his following of Jesus. That's because he has to act fast. Jesus is dead, and he knows that somebody has to step up and bury, claim the body and bury him. So he just throws all that aside and gets going. Now, why all the rush? So really three reasons. The first is the Sabbath was approaching. That's what Mark 42 tells us. It was preparation day. That is the day before Sabbath and evening approached. So this is a simple timing thing. And so the law said that no work could be done on the Sabbath. And so as evening approached, like it said, sundown is coming. And that's the beginning of Sabbath. And so this would put the timing of about 3 to 6 p.m., so less than three hours to get this whole process done. Now, Roman law forbid the burial of a crucified person by anybody but them. And uh, so remember, these were criminals who were crucified. They, and so no one was supposed to take the body down except the soldiers and because they left it out there for birds to desecrate the body and for decomposition to, to set in for a point. Now remember, they would crucify these criminals along the major thoroughfares that people had to travel in and out of Jerusalem. And so they were left there as a reminder to everybody who came in and out of the city that uh, this is what happens to enemies of Rome. Did it on purpose. Now, once they were ta these bodies were taken down, they were cast into a common grave uh, or tossed into the city dump to be burned. That's what happened to these bodies. So that was the law. But in real practice, uh, if the families came and asked for the bodies, a lot of times they would give it to them and uh, let them have them. But in the case of Jesus and, and Nicodemus, uh, sorry, and, and Joseph coming to take it, it was more than just respect happening here. Uh, because he knew what the law of Moses was. And so all the way back in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 21, we have this, this command from, from God saying, if a man is guilty of a capital offense and is put to death, and his body is hung on a tree, he must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him the same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. Now remember, crucifixion did not exist in the time when Moses' law uh, was handed, the law was handed down to Moses. So what he is referring to here is that uh, they would affix a dead body sometimes to a pole to make a point, kind of like what the Romans did. Or when they would, they would uh, execute somebody, they would uh, they would uh, impale them on a spike. And if you were here and we, when we studied Esther, you remember the story of Haman, right? He tried to do that to Mordecai, to hang him on a spike, and then that ended up happening to Haman, you know, when the tables were turned. So, uh, so the law didn't forbid the practice of doing that, but it told, said you could only allow them out there for a short time. But once again, as we've learned all along, as most things in the law is that this was foreshadowing what would take place in Mark 15 perfectly. So Joseph knew that this was something that needed to be done according to the law of Moses, so he had to act really quickly. Then the other thing that maybe uh, Joseph may have heard Jesus say, but of course didn't understand uh, completely is that Jesus prophesied that he would be in the grave for three days and three nights. That's in Matthew 12, 40. And so him being buried quickly and at this time before sundown fulfilled this prophecy. Now, our way of counting time is different than the way they counted time back then. It's because it, they considered any part of a day before sundown was considered a whole day. So if, if five minutes before sundown on Friday was considered the whole day of Friday. And so, uh, so then they would have Sabbath, and then he resurrected Sunday after sunrise. So that was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three days. 
So none of the Gospels really give us any details. All we know that G of how this happened, because this would have been a complicated, difficult process. I mean, if you've ever tried to help somebody who can't bear their own weight, you know how heavy that can be. So we don't know exactly how it happened, only that he had a clean linen cloth. And then once he got him down, he placed him in his own new Tomb. Now, this actually fulfills an Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah, but we don't have time to dig in that today. But so this is Joseph. This is our first eyewitness. Our second eyewitness is the women in verse 47 at the end, and then verse 40 and 41. We'll see those. Uh, and so you can see that these verses here identify this group of women at the crucis. Fiction, and two of them, in verse 47, watched long enough and stayed with it long enough to know where the tomb was and where Jesus' body was laid. Now, this group of women is noted in all four Gospels. And this is not just an insignificant fact that there were some women there, because the Gospels tell us that the only people that stayed to the end of this gruesome ordeal are these women. And if you put this section with what we will learn about next week in chapter 16, then you'll see that these, wi these women, this group of women, are established as the only eyewitnesses to all three events, the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection. See, the disciples are gone. John was there for a little while, but by this time, he's, he's gone. Joseph and Nicodemus, they only show up at the end here. And no one but these women are present at the resurrection of Christ. So besides these girls, everybody else has deserted Jesus. Now, here's the thing to remember about this group, group of women. Seems kind of unimportant. Why are you majoring on this? But it is actually a key point in why we can believe that the scriptures are accurate about the account of Jesus, especially in his death, burial, and resurrection. And, then, and we can know for sure that the story wasn't made up like a lot of people charged that it was. So if you could think like a detective, like we're trying to do here today, you have to consider the uh, status of women at this time in history. They were not seen as credible or reliable uh, witnesses to anything. Even Luke tells us that when they went and told about the resurrection, that they did not believe them, and it seemed to them like nonsense. Some other translation say that it, it seems like idle tales, and uh, that's kind of consistent with the way that women were thought about during this time. They were prone to fantasy and making up stories, and what they said was not given a lot of weight by really anybody. Um, the testimony of women was not accepted in court at all during this time. They couldn't, couldn't uh, represent themselves or even be represented uh, in, in court. So if you were a group of guys that were trying to make up a story about Jesus rising from the dead, who would you pick as eyewitnesses to his resurrection? Or who would you want to be the ones who authenticated where he was buried? Not a group of women, right? That would weaken your story, not strengthen it. So it would have been better to say that the people who saw his resurrection was Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus or any of the disciples, but accounts featuring men as the eyewitnesses would be much, much stronger. The only reason in this time period to assert that women were the first eyewitnesses of this wonderful miracle is because that's what really happened, right? So it is not to the advantage of any of the writers who want to tell this story to include eyewitnesses were women, yet all four Gospels do so. So the fact that women were here is just not a sidebar to the story. It helps us know that what we're reading is fact that we can trust and believe. All right, so that's two of our witnesses. Our last eyewitnesses is the centurion, and he is in verse 39. And we see that, that the centurion stood there in front of Jesus. He heard his cry, saw how he died. He said, surely this man is the son of God. Now, for you who have been here since the beginning or, saw, or all the way back to last fall, the very first lesson that we had, we spent a long time in session one talking about the purpose of the whole letter. Basically, this thesis statement 
4, Mark's letter is, this is the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You remember this? We talked about this for a whole session. This is the point of Mark's whole letter that we see what happens, what he said, what he did, what, how people responded to him, and understand that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what all the miracles, all the power, all the authority was meant to show us. Not that he's a great guy, that we should live by his rules so we'd be happy and healthy and all of that, like many people say today, right? He's a good man, like what he said, but they don't want to go as far as saying what Mark is trying to tell us here. The gospel is not about social change or being good citizens of the world, but that should be the result of us following and listening to Jesus, right? But that's not the point. The gospels clearly proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. He is divine. We have seen that demonstrated over and over and over again as we move through this powerful letter. And here in chapter 15, we arrive at the culmination of Mark's point. And, that is, and this is the first declaration by a human being in his letter that Jesus is the Son of God. We've heard it from demons before. They've said it. We've heard it from God the Father before, both at the transfiguration and at his baptism. But in this letter, no person has said that Jesus is the Son of God until now. And this comes from a pagan employee of Rome. Now, this was a hardened guy. This was not any pale-faced recruit who's at his first uh, execution here. This is a reasoned conclusion of a guy who has been present and overseeing the, and orchestrating the death of hundreds of men in his tenure during the army. And it wasn't because he didn't come to this conclusion because he saw a miracle or he heard Christ teach or he healed somebody in his family. It says here in verse 39 that when he saw, heard his cry and saw how he died, that he was convinced that he was the son of God. Now, this has been no ordinary day for this guy, right? I mean, he's been in a lot of executions before, uh, but this one has earthquakes and he has darkness. There's lots of people around. There's Jewish leaders there. Uh, and, and then this cry from Jesus that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, this had a huge impact on this guy. But what Mark says here is that this centurion, he stood close, and saw how he died, then he believed. This is not just stating what you might expect the guy to say, that, oh, this guy was innocent, or he's been railroaded by all of these Jewish leaders. Oh, he must have been a good man. That's not what the centurion says. He's affirming Jesus' righteousness as the divine Son of God. It's different, right? It's a very bold statement that this guy makes, and it indicated a complete alteration in the basic things that govern this guy's whole life, and especially in his job as a centurion in the Roman military. I mean, he has sworn allegiance to the emperor here, and he's the only one who, in the Roman mind, would have the right to the title, son of God, little g. They thought that the Caesars were divine, and so he, the Caesar, was the embodiment of Roman majesty. You can imagine all the pomp and the majesty and the lavishness that came with everything that Rome was during this time. But this centurion here, he breaks his code, breaks his allegiance in front of his battalion, by the way, and bestows the title reserved only for Caesar on a Jew who ironically has just been executed by him. Okay? So Jesus looks the very opposite of what the might and glory that came with Rome was all about. So how did this transformation take place inside this guy? Well, it's the same way that it took place in Peter or any of us, right? Matthew 16, Jesus says, This was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father, in heaven. This is the Holy Spirit doing his thing in this guy's heart, right? He always points us to the crucified Savior. 
He enlightens us so we can see and believe. He helps unbelievers see the truth. That's what he does. That's part of what his job is and what he does right here in this man's heart. This guy didn't take a class. He didn't see a booklet with the four spiritual laws. He didn't do any of that other stuff. Now, the Holy Spirit can use all of those things, but he doesn't need them to do that, right? <laughs> I mean, um, you can contrast what happened in the heart of this centurion with what was going on in the hearts and minds of the Jewish leaders, right? They're standing there watching the exact same thing happen, the exact same, same scene, right? And they have all the laws, all the rules, and thousands of years of religious history in their background, and they missed it. Their eyes were closed, their hearts were closed, and they mocked and belittled Jesus, and they missed it completely. But this man had basically no training, no understanding about any of that stuff, and yet he saw what was right in front of his eyes. And then he believed. And he opened his mouth to give us a convincing statement of who Jesus really is. All right, so those are our, our witnesses. Now let's back up to the details of Christ's death. We have two things that we're told here in this section. And the first is about the temple veil. Uh, Mark 15, 38 says the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bar bottom. Now you probably heard about the veil before, but there's actually two veils that were in the temple at this time. One to the entrance of the holy place. This one he's talking about is the second one was blocked the entrance to the holy of holies where the priests went on the day of atonement. Now, I don't know what you think about this veil or what you had in your mind, but I always kind of imagined it like this big black curtain that might be like a stage curtain if you go to the theater, right? A little bit thick, uh, thicker than um, like, you know, a curtain at your house, but, you know, big, black, tall, but that's not what it was. I don't know where, where I got this, but that's just what was, what was in my head. Exodus 36 gives a completely different picture of what the veil looked like. Blue, purple, scarlet yarn, tw finely twisted linen with cherubim woven into it by a skilled worker and hanging on these big golden poles. So it was beautiful. This was wonderful. This was an amazing work of art here. And it was also really, really big. 60 feet wide, 30 feet tall. I'm uh, sorry, 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, and about two to four inches thick. That's a thick curtain, right? <laughs> I mean... Uh, and uh, one Jewish writer was talking about this veil in a, a work outside of a scripture said it was so heavy that it took hundreds of priests in the temple to manipulate this thing and move it around. Now, humanly speaking, impossible for a person to tear this from top to bottom. It was just enormous thing, beautiful, heavy, big, colorful, all those things. And, but that it was torn from top to bottom is an important detail. That's because the veil, what it symbolized, was the separation between God, who is holy, and sinful man who can't approach him, right? Sin created a chasm that blocks us from him. But what happened in this moment in Mark 15 is that with the death of Christ, that separation was removed. The temple blocking us from interacting with a holy God was torn in half. It was also the beginning of the new covenant. Now, the old Mosaic covenant was what Hebrews said, then became obsolete with the death of Christ. Remember when we talked about this, when we talked about the Last Supper and what the new covenant was? And so it, just like the old covenant, it was instituted by blood sacrifices. And Christ, as Christ gave himself over to death in this moment, his blood became the seal for this new covenant. And then I remember that there was an earthquake going on, darkness and all of this at the same time. It's a terrifying scene. You can imagine what it must have been like. And uh, so, But that seismic shift that was happening in the physical earth, that it was, if things were moving and shaking, just mimicked the seismic shift that happened in the spiritual realm at the same time. The way to God was open with this dramatic and dramatic fasting fashion. It was split open just like the earth had been split open with this, this earthquake. And after this moment, the landscape was completely altered and would never be the same again. And there's one more thing I wanted to add to this when I was studying this, uh, talking about access, our access being open to God. Uh, there was really, th in this, the, this time, 
there was three hours in the day for prayer for devout Jews. Uh, you probably know uh, this from the story of Daniel, right? You said that he would go into his room and pray three times a day. This is what that's talking about. All the way back, that far back. But during this time, they would pray three times a day. Uh, you can see it still in, in Acts after the resurrection. Uh, and that was at six, three, six, and nine, nine, the third, sixth, and ninth hour of the day that they would pray. And all three of these are referred to in the crucifixion story by Mark. The third hour, Mark 15, 25, it was the third hour when they crucified Jesus. The sixth hour is when darkness covered the land. And in the ninth hour is when Jesus cried out and breathed his last. Now, is that a coincidence? It is not a coincidence. This is foreshadowing again, right? That the basis of all prayer is the sacrifice of Christ. You only have access to God the Father through him. You cannot bypass him and get to the Father. Our prayers just bounce off the ceiling if we try to go around Jesus. We come to God by the way of the cross. This is what Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 even says very clearly, the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear, but what? Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Okay? So, uh, so he doesn't hear you. You can't bypass and go around that barrier that sin causes between you and God. So when they prayed and when we prayed, it's all dependent on this moment when thorough and final access was open to us to the throne room of God. He's the one that does that for us. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, when he says, I'm the way, that's what he's talking about. I'm the way to access to the Father, the only way. So when we accept his sacrifice for our sins, we then have free and total access. Your prayers are heard and received, not because of anything you do, not because you're sincere or whether you have great words to say and they're big and flowery. That's not it. It's because of him. That's the point of the severed veil. We have access and can come to him now. Look what the book of Hebrews tell us about this. It's right that his blood, the blood of Jesus, by, gave us a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain. That's a re reference to the veil. That is his body, okay? Jesus' offers, body offered on the cross was torn asunder. It is the veil through which we enter into the presence of God. He is that new and living way, was what verse 20 tells us. God did the tearing. The veil was removed because Jesus completed the payment for the price for sin. And he gives us access into the presence of God forever. All right, last verse to wrap up our crime scene investigation here. We have the temple veil, and now we have a description of his last breath, Mark 15, 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathe his last. Now this looks like on the surface, like just a statement of fact, right? Like in our true crime shows, right? It's the chronology. Uh, so Jesus was beaten. Jesus was tortured. He was nailed to a cross. And as a result of those attacks on him, a, a enormous damage was done to his body, right? And an investigator might write on the bottom of the, the certificate of death that he desired, died as a result of traumatic injuries. That's what that sounds like, right? But that's not, let's look at these eight words a little bit closer to give us a different picture of what's going on here. So the first one here is uh, with a loud cry. Now, in the Greek, that's, those are, the words are megaphone, or it's where we get our word megaphone, right? So, now usually when a person is dying, what happens to their voice or their ability to speak, right? It doesn't get louder, does it? It gets really quiet. Really quiet, softer, the strength drains away from your body. The ability to speak becomes harder and harder and quieter and quieter. And that would be doubly true in a crucifixion scenario because he had difficulty breathing because of the, 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 the strain that would come across his chest and the pain and, the, and someone under the stress of torture. That you, don't, you wouldn't think they would get louder, 
But here it says that Jesus uttered a loud cry. This is a shout, not a whisper. And so, uh, so what does he shout? Mark doesn't tell us, but John does. He says, is it finished? And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Okay, so the word here, some of you may have already heard this before, but the word here for it is finished is a single Greek word, and the word is tetelestai, which means paid in full. Now, the use of this word during this time was in the business world of the day, and it meant it, uh, for payment of debts. Like, so if somebody had a debt with a merchant, and uh, they finally make that final payment, that the, the uh, owner of the shop would write across his bill, this word, tetelestai, meant that he didn't have anything more to pay. He was done. He didn't have any, his debt was satisfied. And that, of course, is the meaning here, too. When Jesus gave himself on the cross, he fully met the righteous demands of the holy law. Every single one of them. Everything was met. Everything was done. He paid our sin debt in full. And uh, no, so none of the Old Testament sacrifices that, we, that they had been doing for hundreds of years could pay for sin. They only covered them. The blood covered them. And they had to keep repeating them over and over and over again. But when we accept his sacrifice for us by faith, then God writes on our sin debt paid in full. It's not what you did. It's what he did. Paul explains this much more in detail in the book of Colossians. He tells us that he forgave all of our sins, having canceled the written code, that's what that's talking about, with its regulations that were against us, that stood opposed to us. And the reference to that written code there would be the law that condemns us, right? We're all guilty. We stand before the law. It's like, okay, you didn't even keep one of them, let alone all of them, right? And so that the legal charges that are against us because of the law have been taken away through the cross. And that verse 15 there is important too. So while all the evil and twisted uh, spiritual forces were celebrating and excited about the Mormon uh, uh, of the death of Christ, thinking that they had won, what was really happening was another paradox that we saw last time is, is that they were being made a spectacle of because his death disarmed them. They have no power over followers of Jesus. Sin's power is broken. And what they thought was a triumph over him, uh, and it was over everything that was godly and holy, they were being triumphed over in this moment. All right, back to Mark, Mark 37 to wrap this up. So here we have that uh, Jesus breathed his last, the rest, rest of that. Um, so we have the loud cry opposite of what you would think in this moment. This is a cry of victory, not defeat. Then Jesus breathed his last. So grammatically, the word breathed is in the arrow's tense and the active voice. And you're like, okay, I've been a long time since grammar and I don't really want to go back, but just hang with me for a second. The arrow's tense means a completed action. That means it's once and done, one time happened. And so, the, so what here it would mean in this moment in time that is in 33 A.D., Jesus' respirations stopped. He didn't breathe another breath after this moment. So that's once and done. Okay. The second, the active voice, tells us that the subject is carrying out the action. And it is a voluntary choice. And this is important because it was an act of his own will that he took that last breath. Okay. So uh, this is what John says, uh, what Jesus says in John 10, 18. No one has taken my life away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. This is what he was telling them here. So, uh, so Jesus was not the victim of lies and plots of Jewish leaders. Uh, he was not the casualty of a Roman execution squad. No amount of torture would have been sufficient to kill Jesus. Okay, Death only came to Jesus when he chose to surrender to it. Remember this quote from a couple of lessons ago? Others may act against Jesus Christ, but they don't act upon him. This includes death, okay? It had no power over him. The beatings, the cross, the lack of breath, the torture, none of that could overpower him and cause his death. Why? This is what the Bible tells us. 
The wages of what? Sin is death. Ezekiel 18, 20, the soul who sins dies. And 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the sting of death is sin. Okay? Death only reigns where sin resides. Jesus committed no sin. His body, soul, and spirit were untainted. Jesus knew no sin, so death could not overpower him. And here in Mark, we see that Jesus chose instead by an act of his will to hand himself over to death. Now, at any point in this process, Jesus could have stopped what was going on. He could have spoken out and said no more. He could have called for that legions of angels that we talked about last week to rescue him. And all of heaven's power was available to him at all times. He was not the victim of what they were doing to him. He willingly chose to endure the hostility and brutality with the full ability to end it at any point in time. Now that should make us marvel at this all the moment, all the more, right? I mean, what thing in your life that's causing you pain would you not choose to exit if you had the power to do it, right? All of them? Yes, all of them. <laughs> go ahead, and, go ahead and agree to it because. If the truth be known, most of our prayers are attempts to find the exit portal, right? God, free me from this. Change that. Don't do this anymore because it's causing me pain. It's causing me hurt. I don't want it. That's what we usually pray about it, right? We want to get out by any means necessary. But he knew what was coming and endure it fu endured it fully and chose to stay. That was a free choice on his part. And just as the free choice given to Adam and Eve in the garden brought us into the bondage of sin, his free choice to submit to death on the cross would walk us out of it. Okay? So we talked about this a little bit, uh, 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 we talked about this a little bit last week, but the cry of Jesus from the cross just a few verses before this was not expression of Christ's abandon, Christ being abandonment, but God, the entire Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Spirit were 100% together, always together, bringing forth the offer of salvation to humanity in this moment. That's what 2 Corinthians 5, 19 says. God was reconciling to the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. God has never run from sinful people. He was, and he still is, the instigator of the restoration of a relationship, which is exactly what we see in Mark 15. God is powerful enough to swallow up sin and to cleanse us from it and to bring about our wholeness through Christ. Only he can do that. When Christ did, so did sin's power. It was ended for all of us who believe. Remember that. This is what's happening on the cross. That is super important to understand. He chose to die. Now, who would do that for you? Only one who loved and cared for you with an, in an overwhelming and unmistakable way. It was his choice to die for you that leads you to a choice of your own. And that is, will you choose to live for him? It's just as much of a choice for us as the choice it is, was for him to die. Voluntary and deliberate. So at the end of our crime scene investigation here, uh, it, it might be, and what you need to do is do something very similar to what the centurion did. That is, see Jesus as the true, only one Son of God. It might be for the first time in salvation, or it might be, that you were saved a long time ago, but the culture has kind of pasted itself over the top of your commitment. And what you need is a seismic shift from passive to active faith, active belief, just like this guy, he, to see who Jesus is and to let him rewrite everything that your life has been built on. Or you might need to be like the women who have followed and served for a very long time. Now, but though, be willing to say, I know because I have seen and I have experienced firsthand 
who Jesus really is. So it's time to be an eyewitness to what you know to be true, even if what people think you're saying is nonsense, right? Or finally, where most of us probably land is be like Joseph of Arimathea. Um, that is, we kind of are disciples in secret for the most part. We believe, but maybe we're a little nervous about speaking up, about what might people might say or think. But because now of Christ's voluntary decision to die for you, because of what you know, what you believe, what you have seen, what you understand about him, you need to make a decision to stop being afraid of what others might say or, uh, or what it might cost you and allow your belief in Christ to motivate you to change. And remember, just like him, time is short. Night is falling for all of us. You only have a short time to act. And that's what Joseph of Arimathea did uh, in this moment and what we're called to do right now. We're witnesses of the truth. We know it just as surely as all of these people. It's time to put something into action and say what we believe. Because Christ chose death. It enables us to choose life. Choose a life of faithfulness and allow it to permeate everything we are. Amen? God, we just thank you for all the details that you can just read right over and not really get the impact. But God, it's, your word is so deep and so broad and so full. God, help, it, help us to read it with new eyes and to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit that calls us to action. Not just to read, not just to stand by, and, and, and look at what happened, but call to action to be those faithful witnesses to what we know to be the truth. God, give us encouragement, challenge us where we need to be challenged, uh, to change whatever it is in our lives that would make us faithful followers of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.